Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Brianna Tybee from Thrive Chiropractic and I am coming to you virtually today to talk about stress. And um, let me back up for a second. Um, again, I'm a chiropractor with Thrive Chiropractic and while most of my time is spent in the clinic with my hands on patients, I do try to get out and provide educational um, experiences like this with the goal of helping um, empower you to make choices that um, can help change the trajectory of your overall health. So um, today our topic is stress. And the reason that this is such an applicable topic is that um, stress was linked to six of the leading causes of death last year, including things like heart disease, cancer, um, and suicide. So clearly it's having a huge impact on our health overall. And it's something that uh, most of us largely can't avoid either. So while a lot of times uh, you get these educational uh, moments supplied by your employer. You come and you have a free lunch if it's a lunch and learn um, and it's a nice way to tap out of your day. I would actually really encourage you to try to be able to take something away um, from this lecture. I'm going to be throwing a lot of tips and guidelines and those types of things your way and if something resonates with you um, as a tool that you can actually start to implement, I would really encourage you to jot it down so that you can actually walk away from this lecture with um, things that you can start doing immediately to really change your overall health. So when we talk about any health-related topic, the goal is always to move you to a place of what we call optimal health. And optimal health means different things to different people, but in my world, what optimal health means is as close to 100% function of all of your tissues, organs, and cells. Because when the tissues, organs, and cells in your body are functioning optimally and at the way that they're supposed to, your body has this awesome ability to adapt to changing conditions. Well, what does that mean? Well, maybe you go try a new workout class and you aren't leveled on the floor the next day unable to walk. Your body might be a little bit sore, but it can go about its business. Or maybe you're at work and you've got people walking by your workspace coughing and sneezing constantly throughout the winter and rather than being out sick once every couple of weeks after that, your body just kind of absorbs this and takes it on and keeps the immune system going and you're okay. So this adaptability is really what we're looking for and really what keeps us functioning at our highest level. Now if you think about optimal health on a spectrum and optimal health is over here, as we slide down away from that, what do we think that that might look like? Well, people might say, well, at the end of the day, I'm really fatigued. I have a headache at the end of the day. My body um, hurts at the end of the day. I can't do the activity that I want to. I'm irritable. I can't sleep well. These are all things that people complain about. And if we lump all of these things together, we can call those symptoms. And what's really important to understand is that symptoms are not just something that happen to you, they're actually your body's communication mechanism to tell you that your body's in a place where it can no longer adapt. So if you think about the fact that symptoms don't happen until your body's past this point where it can adapt, symptoms are actually a little bit like the oil light in your car. The oil light in your car doesn't come on until you actually have to do something or you're at risk of causing damage. So when I say that, I want you to think about what you might be experiencing. When I went through that list of symptoms before, are you irritable? Do you have pain? Are you fatigued? Do you have trouble sleeping at night? And I want you to think about those things and ask yourself, what is my body trying to communicate with me? And I'm going to give you a little hint. It is not communicating to you that you have a Tylenol or Tums deficiency. And while taking these things occasionally to manage symptoms is okay, when that's our go-to method, it's really like opening up the glove box in your car, taking out a roll of duct tape and sticking that over the oil light rather than actually going to get an oil change and take care of the problem at its root level. So I just want you to be thinking about that as we go through the lecture today. What is your body actually trying to communicate to you? Now, if we're going to try to understand how to manage stress, we have to understand at a base level what stress is to begin with. And it's really important to understand that in life, we have events that happen and then we have how we react to them. And it is only when your body perceives something as stressful that your body actually reacts to it. And once it has perceived something as stressful, you get a cascade of neurological and hormonal responses in the body. And this is what we call the stress response. 
Now, it's really critical to understand that the stress response that we experience now is exactly the same as the stress response that occurred in our hunter-gatherer ancestors. And this response was really designed to keep you safe long enough to keep you alive. And what do I mean by that? Well, if, if you think about our hunter-gatherer ancestors, if they had a predator running toward them, the stress response was designed to get their body doing things that could remove them from that situation long enough to keep them alive. So if you think about it from those terms, our stress response is really that fight or flight response that we talk about. So I really want you to keep in mind that the way that our bodies are responding now is exactly the same way that our bodies responded way back in the hunter-gatherer times. So once your body has decided that something is stressful, what is involved in this stress response? Well, the first thing that I want to touch on is the stress hormone, which is cortisol, because you're gonna hear me referring back to cortisol a ton throughout this lecture because where our cortisol levels are in our body are a large indicator of how our body is responding and managing stress. So cortisol is the stress hormone and it affects everything from how your body handles blood sugar to inflammation and memory. And a good example of this is I want you to think about a time when you're very stressed out at work or with a family situation and when you go home at the end of the day, how many of you sit down and say, gosh, all I want to eat right now is a bunch of greens and lean proteins? No, we don't want any of that. We want all the carbs all the time. Give me some pizza and mac and cheese, right? Well, this was actually physiologically designed to be this way because if you needed to run away from that big predator, the most readily available source of quick energy would be carbohydrates because they convert to sugar in the body. But the problem is when we're craving these over and over and over because of the stress response, it results in this very specific accumulation of fat in the body. And I'm sure you've all heard that um, the apple shape or when we accumulate a bunch of fat around our midsection is considered to be extremely unhealthy. Well, that's very true because that accumulation of fat is actually fat that's around our organs and not just in the soft tissue. And experts actually refer to this as diseased fat. So this is just one example of the way that cortisol interacts with our body, but we're going to talk about a lot of other things that this relates to as well. When we are involved in a quick stress response, another thing that happens is we get that quick release of endorphins, right? We all know that we need that quick shot of sort of energy to get us motivated. But the problem is with endorphins comes an increased blood pressure. And so if we are having this release of endorphins over several weeks or days or months, this also results in a long-term elevated blood pressure as well, which is no good. Now, if you were needing to run away from a predator, one thing that your body does extremely intelligently is it tries to decide which systems are the most important to keep you safe at that point. So what happens is your body starts to redistribute its resources. So if you needed to run away from this big predator, do you think that it would be really critical to digest the food that you might be eating as you're watching this? Well, no, that wouldn't be considered important. But again, if we look at this over a long period of time, now we're looking at things like acid reflux, indigestion, constipation, none of which is very fun, right? The other system that is very largely ignored during a stress response is our immune system. And how many of you guys can relate to the fact that you have a really high stress project or deadline at work, or you've got your in-laws coming to stay with you for a week, right? And so during this stressful period, you go, 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 and um, you're just kind of burning the candle at both ends and you're feeling that stress. And then the second that project is over, or the second those in-laws leave your house, you get a cold right? Well, it's because during this whole time of stress, your immune system's been ignored because that wasn't considered important. And then the second that you let down from that, your immune system's weak and you're just ripe to get sick. So body starts deciding what's more important. Another thing that happens is that our bodies don't want to downregulate. And what do I mean by that? Well, downregulating is when we can go home, wind down at the end of the night, our bodies can just come down and relax and get us in a place where we're ready for some restful sleep and that type of thing. Well, in the stress response, 
we have a specific part of the nervous system that's stimulated, which is the sympathetic part of the nervous system. And when this is being stimulated over and over and over again, it's sort of like having the gas pedal in your car just stuck on. So we call this sympathetic overdrive. And if you think back to that hunter-gatherer ancestor situation, if you had a predator coming at you, being able to just lay down on the ground and quickly take a nap would not serve you well. So our body gets in this overdrive situation, and then what that means is at the end of the day, we have a hard time winding down. We have a hard time relaxing, and then maybe we can't fall asleep very well, but if we do fall asleep, we can't stay asleep and get a restful night's sleep as well. So um, our bodies just get stuck in the sympathetic overdrive, and we can't come down at the end of the day. And the last little piece that I want to talk about in terms of um, the actual effects of the stress response is what it does to our brain. And it actually has an Alzheimer's-like effect on your brain. And a study was done where um, scientists mapped different parts of the brain while they had people doing what they called um, stressful multitasking. So they had a bunch of things that they had to complete under a condensed period of time. And at the beginning of this experiment, when they mapped the brain and people were in control and that time frame wasn't squeezing in on them, the part of the brain that was most heavily stimulated was the executive functioning part of the brain. And that has to do with reasoning and planning and organization. Now, as that timer started to ding down and people were fatigued and more stressed about completing this task, the brain then flipped over to the more reptilian part of the brain, which is more emotional and impulsive. So basically what happened as the stress increased over this period of time is that people went from a, a state of clarity and organization to one of confusion and frustration. So again, if we think about this big picture, if we're having the stress response occurring over a long period of time, our brains just aren't even functioning at their most optimal level. So again, while all of these things were designed to keep us safe and all of them were designed to keep us alive, they were meant for short-term function. And so if you think about our stressors today being repetitive and unrelenting, it's sort of like taking a turbocharged engine and putting it in a Ford Fiesta. It's just not the way that it was designed to run. And now that is why we're feeling the effects of it in our body. So. When we talk about stress, I really like to break it down into the three different types of stress that we experience and then try to figure out how we can combat each one of those. So the three types of stress that we experience are mental, chemical, and physical. Under the category of mental, I like to say is work, relationships, and money. Chemical falls into one of two categories, and it's either toxicity, which is getting too much of the bad stuff put into our body, or deficiency, which means we're not getting enough of the good stuff put into our body. And then the third type of stress is physical stress. And this is something that most of us can wrap our heads around pretty easily. It's sitting in a chair eight hours a day. It's commuting more than 30 minutes each way from our job. It's not getting enough exercise. It's the effects of previous accidents and injuries on our body. So we've got the three types, mental, chemical, and physical. But it's really important to understand that your body doesn't differentiate between these types of stress. It just creates one cumulative load. So if you think about your body being like a three gallon bucket that can only ever hold three gallons of water, if two gallons of that bucket are filled with a spouse you hate and a job you hate, you now have one gallon left for everything else before that bucket overflows. So as I'm giving you tips for each of these types of stress, what we're trying to do is to take stuff out of that bucket so that your body has a greater capacity to take things on before it overflows and crosses that threshold where you're starting to experience the effects of stress. So I want to start with that mental stress piece. And I really think that mental stress is the most challenging of the three because if you remember, I said it's work relationships and money. Well, most of us have to work for a living. We have to pay our bills and figure out how that's all going to get taken care of. And whether it's a work relationship or a personal relationship or family, we are involved in relationships all the time. So many of the mental stressors just can't be avoided. So we have to figure out how to manage that. And the first thing that I would recommend is to just simply try to carve out 10 minutes a day that does something that fuels you mentally. And this is where it becomes really personal because maybe that's more of a spiritual time for you. Maybe it's a meditation time. Maybe it's exercising or listening to music. But try to really find 10 minutes a day that is devoted just to something that fuels you. 
One of the things you could do during this time um, is practice a little bit of gratitude. And gratitude is simply acknowledging things that we appreciate in our life. Now, if you back up a little bit to when I was talking about the stress response, we talked about the fact that we get in that sympathetic overdrive where our gas pedal is stuck on. Well, when we simply think about and acknowledge things that we appreciate in our life, it actually stimulates a different part of your nervous system called the um, parasympathetics. And the parasympathetics are like the brake pedal. So we actually stimulate that brake pedal to slow us down, and also it reduces that release of cortisol or the stress hormone in our body. And it's actually found that people who practice daily gratitude produce up to 23% lower levels of cortisol in their body than people who don't. So simply sitting down and writing down like three things a day that we can appreciate in our life that day can actually have a physiological change in the body and the stress response. Also, it's found that when people practice gratitude, they typically have uh, lower rates of depressed mood and increased quality of sleep. And interestingly enough, uh, it's also shown that there can be up to a 25% reduction in the amount of dietary fat that people consume over the course of the day when they practice gratitude. And that's likely to that lower um, rate of cortisol released in your body, because if you recall, when we have high levels of cortisol, we crave more of those um, foods that are bad for us. So um, it can actually change the way that you're eating, which I find really, really interesting. Um, another thing that you can do is implement music throughout your day. Now, the first time I talked about this, I had somebody raise their hand and say, well, what if it's music that I hate? And so I'll be very clear and tell you that you should implement music that you enjoy throughout your day. And when we listen to music that we enjoy, our bodies actually tend to lower our blood pressure and pulse and our cortisol levels tend to be reduced as well. Um, in hospitals, people are reporting lower levels of anxiety both pre- and post-op when music is used in those areas of the hospital. And in retirement communities, um, they are saying that residents are, pro are reporting lower levels of depression and higher levels of self-esteem when music is incorporated as a regular part of their day in these retirement communities. So simply having music on during your commute or in your workspace or while you're cooking dinner can re actually lower that stress response in our body. Now, one of the most critical things that you can do from a mental um, stress capacity is to try to foster healthy relationships and social networks in your body. A really fascinating thing happens in your body when the stress response is released, and that is that your body actually has a built-in response for stress resilience, which is human connection. And with cortisol released in your body, another hormone that is also released is oxytocin. And oxytocin is that cuddle hormone that's released actually when you have a baby. And when you have oxytocin released in your body, it makes you crave uh, support and connection with other people. So because human connection has such a positive response on stress management, our bodies actually have a built-in way to make us crave that connection with other people, which I find super fascinating. Now, one way that uh, you can see this played out was a study that was done with a large population of junior high kids where they had these kids for a week straight, journal five times throughout the day, and then they also took swabs of the insides of their cheeks to measure their cortisol levels. And what they found was these children who had at least one friend around them during stressful periods of the day had lowered measured levels of cortisol in their bodies and increased reported self-esteem during these stress times than kids were who, who were simply alone at the same time. So having people around you during stressful periods can actually help your body manage these stressful periods more effectively. Um, having a conversation with somebody that you care about actually increases your executive functioning. It's shown that a 10-minute conversation with somebody um, that you care about boosts this executive functioning center of your brain. Um, time and time again, they show that people who are surrounded with strong uh, social networks and communities tend to live longer also than people who uh, are tending to be more isolated. And also, side note on that, when you are around people who you care about, you tend to laugh more. And laughing actually reduces your stress response as well. In one hearty course of laughter, what happens is our, our uh, stress response is fired all the way up and then comes all the way back down. And the net result of this is that we, feel, we get lowered stress response and we feel relaxed. It, 
eases your digestion, it boozes, boosts your immune function, and it releases your body's natural painkillers. So make sure that you have lots of people that you care about around you and that they're people that make you laugh because laughing with people you care about is actually good for your health. Now, chemical stress is the next area I want to talk about. And whereas I think mental stress is the most challenging to control because we can't avoid it, I think chemical stress is one of the areas where we have the most control. So if you'll recall, chemical stress is basically what we're putting into our body, so either too much of the bad or too little of the good. Now, I think the first guideline that I say about chemical stress should be an obvious one, but if you're somebody who's smoking, whether that's cigarettes or vaping, either way, uh, this is an enormous chemical stress to your body and one that we have very much control over. So if you are smoking in any way, shape, or form, obviously cutting this out is going to be one of your greatest reductions in chemical stress. Now the next is basically just to eat real food. And I know that this sounds foolish, but if you think about what we eat conveniently these days, a lot of it is, is just a lot of chemical stuff and not actually food. One of my favorite people to reference um, in this realm is Michael Pollan, and he is an author and wrote a fantastic book called In Defense of Food, which talks about um, sort of the current food culture. And my favorite piece of advice that he gives is to not eat anything that our grandparents wouldn't identify as food. And this sounds kind of funny, right? But if you walk into one of our grocery stores these days and you look at all those center aisles with boxes of things that can stay on the shelf for a very long time, none of that is really food. The food that's real food can be found around the perimeter of the grocery store, which I'm sure you've all heard before, but this is where we're going to find things like produce, fresh fresh fruits and vegetables. We're going to find our lean meats and proteins there, some nuts and seeds, and some limited grains as well. Um, along this same line, I like to tell people to really start paying attention to their ingredients because if you simply start paying attention, you may not change immediately, but as you become more aware, you will start thinking differently about the food that you're eating. And what I encourage you to do is look at that ingredient list and try to have the food that you're buying have five ingredients or fewer and be able to um, pronounce the ingredients on the label. And you'll also start to realize sneaky things that happen within the food industry when you start paying attention. And the example that I like to use is actually with yogurt. So if you go to your dairy case and you pick out just a plain Greek yogurt, there's going to be four to five ingredients in there. And the unpronounceable items or ingredients in there are actually the healthy bacteria strains that are good for you within that yogurt. Now, if the plain Greek yogurt is right here. If we scoot over in our aisle a little bit, there's these brightly colored boxes that are really attractive to children called Gogurt. And the first thing I would tell you is that if we have to call something something other than what it is, that's your first indicator. But if you look at the labels on something like this, um, in Gogurt specifically, there are 14 different ingredients. And number two on the list is sugar. And number four on the list is high fructose corn syrup. So because you have to list ingredients in based on the quantity that's in the item, this company used two separate sweeteners in order to be able to split it between two and four because had they just used sugar, it would have had to be number one on the list. So simply taking a minute to look at your ingredients, see what's in it, see the quantity of what's in it, will make you start thinking differently about what we're putting into our bodies. And I really encourage you to try to incorporate as much real food into your diet as possible. Now the next thing that we want to talk about in regards to chemical assault on your body is caffeine. And what you're going to hear me say here is to reduce your caffeine, not eliminate. Because I know the second I tell people to eliminate caffeine, I'm going to get daggers shot at me from every direction. Um, a little bit of caffeine is not a bad thing, but when you're throwing down a full pot of coffee in the morning and then going out for a vente um, latte at Starbucks mid-afternoon, this is when it becomes more problematic. Um, the first thing is that caffeine is a stimulant. So when we're already involved in a stress response where everything's heightened, um, this is going to exacerbate that. Um, when we have a stimulant, it e increases our blood pressure and increases um, our cortisol release. So we want to try to mitigate that as much as possible. Um, also, a study came out of Duke University um, several years ago um, that talked about the correlation between caffeine and stress. And if you recall way at the beginning of this lecture, I said that your body only launches the stress response when it perceives something as stressful. 
Well, the study out of Duke indicated that when we're over-caffeinated, it increases our perception of stress. So things that may not have otherwise stimulated the stress response in your body may stimulate that response if we're over-caffeinated. So again, you don't need to eliminate caffeine, but maybe just reduce your overall level if you're somebody who's really relying on that throughout the day. And while we're talking about caffeine, um, coffee is our one area, but then the other prime area that people consume caffeine is with soda. And I will just say that if there was one thing that you could do to change your chemical assault on your body, if you are a heavy soda drinker, it would be to eliminate soda. Um, and I will say though, if you're going to drink soda, I'd actually rather have you drinking the real thing than the fake stuff. The chemicals that are in diet soda were completely unrecognizable to the human body until about 30 years ago, so we don't actually know what the long-term effects of some of these sweeteners are. So I'd rather have you just drink the real stuff if you're going to drink it, but do keep in mind that it's the equivalent of putting 12 teaspoons of sugar into a bowl and eating it with a spoon if you're drinking um, one can of regular soda. Um, interestingly enough, also, um, I'm sure several of you have heard that uh, people who drink diet soda tend to gain more weight than people who don't. And it's a really, really interesting physiological response in your body because your body and your brain are really smart. And when you eat something sweet with a fake sweetener in it, your brain makes a calculation about what caloric payoff it's going to get for that level of sweetness. And then when we don't get that caloric payoff because of fake sweeteners, your body wants to make up that difference over the course of the rest of the day. So it's going to make you crave more of those types of foods and ultimately end up consuming more calories over the course of the day. So um, if you can eliminate soda and those fake sweeteners, um, that is a huge, huge reduction to your overall um, chemical stress load. On the flip side of that, we want to make sure that we're making sure to hydrate enough. Um, we live in a fairly dehydrated uh, society just because people are drinking all these other things and not taking the time to actually just consume the amount of water that they should. Our bodies are comprised of 70% water and it wants to keep that balance at all times. And if we deprive it of this hydration, it wants to pull water from everything else that we're putting in our body. And the net result of that is water weight gain and bloating. And I don't know about anybody else, but I don't wake up in the morning going, gosh, if I could be bloated today, I would just be feeling my most confident life, right? No. So we need to give it water so that it doesn't have to hold on to it from everywhere else. Um, also, once you're eating these real foods from the grocery store that we talked about, the way that the nutrients get into the body and into the cells is via hydration, and the way that it rids itself of waste is also via water. So we want to make sure that we're getting that nice flushing of the system in there. Um, hydration also eases digestion and lubricates your joints as well. So um, lots of benefits to staying hydrated. Best rule of thumb that I can give you is to take your body weight, divide that in half, and that is the number of ounces per water you should shoot to drink every day. And my best piece of advice on that is to have a water bottle at wherever your workstation is because if it's there you will drink it but if it's not you won't um, also if you're drinking more water you're gonna have to get up to both fill the bottle and to go to the bathroom more often and this gives you a break from the physical stress of being at a workstation for too long so um, get that water in every day now another um, thing that we can do to try to reduce chemical stress and make up the gaps that we're not getting in our nutrition is to take supplements and supplements are really tricky because Every time you turn on your TV, there's a different supplement for something different going on in your body. It can be really overwhelming. But I like to suggest just a couple that um, really are a baseline for everybody and really address the specific stressors that we have going on today in society. So the first one that I always recommend is a multiple vitamin. And that's because uh, most of you are not consuming five to six servings of fruits and vegetables every day. And even if we are, a lot of our foods are coming from depleted soil supplies due to modern um, farming practices. So even if we're getting the fruits and vegetables that we should, which again, most of us aren't, they may not even have the nutritional supply that we're looking for. And so a multiple vitamin is just going to help fill in those gaps and make sure that you're getting sort of a complete um, nutritional profile. The second that I like to talk about is fish oil or omega-3 fatty acid. And when fish oil first came on the scene, it was really linked to a lot of brain support and brain health. And this is absolutely valid because the coating that is over our 
brains and spinal cords is all comprised of this omega-3 fatty acids, so it really helps to support those tissues. But where it really is more important um, these days and in terms of stress as well has to do with inflammation. So there are omega-3 fatty acids which are anti-inflammatory, but then there are also omega-6 fatty acids which are pro-inflammatory. And we should be eating a ratio of about 1 to 1 to 1 to 4 omega-3 to omega-6. But in the current standard Western diet, we're eating about 1 omega-3 to around 20 omega-6. So we're just in this super inflamed state. And part of that has to do with the fact that anything that can sit stable on a shelf for a long period of time requires omega-6 fatty acids to do so. So when we take um, omega-3 fatty acids or fish oil, it helps to um, even out that balance um, between pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory. Now people will ask me, can't I just eat a lot of fish? And my answer is no, because you'd have to be eating first quite a bit, but second of all, you'd have to be eating all of the right kinds of fish that was completely naturally raised because if they're not eating that natural flora and fauna in their um, natural environment, they're not even producing the omega-3s the way that we need to um, in order to make a difference. Um, I've also had questions from vegetarians who don't want to consume animal products about how they can get omega-3 fatty acids in. And the first I would say is that flaxseed is a great source. Um, it just needs to be ground up and then the body requires one extra step in order for it to be absorbed, but it's still a great source. And the other one that I love are chia seeds. And chia seeds can be thrown into things like salads and you don't even know they're there, or they can be put into smoothies or liquid. Um, just be aware that if you are a person who um, has textural issues that when chia seeds sit in liquid for a long period of time, they do tend to get a little bit of a gelatinous coating on them, so you want to consume them quickly. Um, biggest complaint I get about fish oils is that people say they burp them up over the course of the day. Well, first of all, I would tell you, Never take a fish oil on an empty stomach because they will stick with you for the rest of the day if you do so. Um, the second is that they come in tons of flavors now, lemon, berry, all over the place. So that helps um, reduce that flavor a little bit. But also, best tip I can give you is to pop them in your freezer. If you keep them in your freezer, they'll tend to stay down better. But again, you always want to consume them with uh, food. Now, another one that is critically important, um, particularly where we live here in Minnesota, is vitamin D. Now, vitamin D is produced in the human body by exposure to UV sunlight. And so, obviously, in the winter here in the Midwest, we are just inherently deprived of that sunlight that we need to produce um, appropriate levels of vitamin D. Now, most of you have probably heard vitamin D in relation to um, bone health. And this is absolutely valid because uh, vitamin D is required for the absorption of calcium in the body, which gives us that good, strong um, bone health. But where it's really becoming more important is that deficient levels of vitamin D are strongly associated to certain types of cancers, um, like testicular and ovarian cancer. And actually, rates of these cancers tend to be higher in the northern part of our country, where we get less exposure to sunlight, than in the southern parts where we don't. So we want to make sure that we're really boosting those vitamin D levels. Um, it's also really good for your immune system as well, which if you recall, when we're in high periods of stress, tends to be a little bit more ignored. So um, get that vitamin D in. And the last one that I want to talk about that is so hugely important for so many reasons is um, probiotics. So probiotics are starting to get a lot more um, attention these days, which is fantastic because um, so many health issues are related back to our gut. So your gut is basically this little ecosystem of its own. It's got little bacteria and plants in there, and um, we need to keep it fed with good bacteria to keep it alive and thriving. But unfortunately, we're eating a lot of chemicals. We're not getting enough of those bacteria, and so that starts to wear down that whole ecosystem on the inside of our gut. And first of all, that's going to start looking like digestive upset, which is not fun for anybody. Nobody wants acid reflux, indigestion, constipation, diarrhea, or any of these things, right? But there are two other reasons why keeping this gut system is healthy is so important. And the first is that up to 70% of your immune system lies within the lining of your gut. So if you have a gut that is not healthy, that's not being fed appropriately, that's getting a constant chemical assault, your immune system just has no shot at keeping you healthy, um, particularly at a time um, right now, whether it's during the winter or during a pandemic, where we really need to have a healthy immune system. So we need to give ourselves probiotics to really feed that system. Um, the other area that is so critically important and relates very closely to stress as well, mental stress, is that 
when we're being formed in the body as a baby, your gut and your brain are actually its own little system called the enteric system. And as we continue to develop, the brain and the gut separate out from each other, but they come from the same fundamental tissues. And what's being um, found now is that up to 80% of the serotonin or the feel-good chemicals in your brain are actually produced in the lining of the gut. So if we have a gut that's worn down and is not being fed what it needs to uh, thrive, you can't even produce those chemicals that keep you feeling positive and happy um, or maintain those at all. So we need to keep really, really good gut health in order to keep ourselves both physically healthy, but also mentally healthy. So um, try to make sure that if you had to, actually, if you had to pick one out of everything, this may be the most critically important because it affects your body in so many different ways. Um, so that covers most of our chemical stress. So then I want to take um, a little bit of time to talk about uh, physical stress. So several people, most people these days, are stuck in front of a computer for the majority of their day, whether that's seated or standing. Um, that's just not a lot of movement. We were designed to move pretty much constantly, and the average American is sitting about 13 hours a day. And when we're seated or immobile for long periods of time, this causes a lot of dysfunction within our musculoskeletal system and in our joints. And when we lose proper motion and function or we have dysfunction in our musculoskeletal system, it actually sends surges of negative messaging to the brain. And when we get negative messaging shot up to the brain, it increases that stress response. So we want to make sure that we're trying to counteract this as much as we can, given the expectation that we are still at this workstation. So the first thing that I would say is to make sure that your workstation is set up appropriately. And I'm going to target this towards seated workers because that's most um, of the people that we're speaking to. So when you look at your workstation, you want to make sure that your chair is first set up properly. And you want to make sure that your knees and your hips are at a 90 degree angle and that your feet are very firmly planted on the ground. When your feet dangle or you have them tucked up underneath you, um, it creates a lot of stress and strain on the pelvis and low back. Now I'm a perfect example. I'm five feet tall and I have yet to meet a desk that gets me with seated or firmly planted feet on the floor. So I often have to grab a box or something that I can find around to put under my feet so that they're firmly planted on the ground. So, you know, improvise, try to find what you can to make sure you've got the 90 degrees at the hips, 90 degrees at the knees, and your feet are firmly planted. You also want to have the lower part of your back um, firmly seated against the back of your chair because when we get that support in the low back, it tends to bring these shoulders and upper back back as well, which is really important because when we're stuck in front of a computer like this all day, our shoulders are going to tend to roll forward, these muscles in the chest get shortened and tightened, and then that pulls um, across that mid-back and shoots the head forward. And all of this uh, can tie back to when you are at the end of the day and you've got that nagging headache over the top of your eyes or that strain between the shoulder blades. All of that is a result of sitting like this all day long in front of your computer. So have that low back firmly planted against the back of your chair and then try to focus on keeping those shoulders back. You want to have your elbows at about a 100 degree angle because when we have those elbows at 100 degrees, it's going to put your wrists in a nice neutral position. And we don't want your wrists either shoved up or shoved down or hanging like this because that's when we start to get into carpal tunnel type issues. So if we keep that elbow at a nice 100 degree angle, it'll try to keep those wrists nice and neutral at your keyboard. And then one of the things I see um, is the biggest issue for people are monitor heights on your computer. And the top of your monitor um, should be level with your chin. So take a look at that and try to figure out do we need to lower it, do we need to raise it. Now for those of you who are stuck on laptops, laptops are a little bit of a double whammy because the screen is going to be lower than you want it to be and the keyboard is going to tend to be higher than you want it to be. So if it's possible for you to get a remote keyboard so that you can have the screen higher and um, your keyboard at an appropriate height, that's your best option. But if you have to um, work on a laptop with no other option, you want to try to split the difference and so you would want the top of your monitor to be about level with your neck and that's going to split the difference between the two. But if you can get that remote keyboard, um, that's really the best thing that you can do. 
Now the key rule when you're stuck um, at a workstation is that for every 30 minutes that you spend seated, you want to get up and incorporate two minutes of mobility or movement into your day. So you can set a timer on your phone, you can set a timer on your Outlook calendar, but for every 30 minutes that you're sedentary, you want to get up and incorporate some kind of movement into the body. And it doesn't need to be a big deal, but simply getting up and shaking the body out, doing some stretches, um, doing some mobility work, taking a little walk, whether it's to fill up that water bottle or go to the bathroom, um, will make a big difference and reset your posture. If you're at your workstation um, during this two minutes, some easy things that you can do are basic neck ranges of motion. So you can simply come to flexion and extension. You can bring your ear to either shoulder and turn and look over that shoulder. And if you recall, I was just talking about how this tends to be the area that gets really shortened and tightened. My favorite uh, stretch to try to open that area up is to take your hand and turn it palm up and sit on it. So right now I'm sitting on my left hand palm up and then what I'm going to do is turn my head away from that hand and tilt it back. And when you do this, you'll get a stretch that goes all the way through the front part of the neck and down into the chest. And then you always want to make sure that you're evening yourself out, so make sure you do both sides um, because we want symmetry. You can also stand up, lean forward, and simply let your spine roll vertebrae by vertebrae all the way up. This is just going to get some nice movement in through those joints and get them moving again after they've been stuck for some time. And my very favorite mobility exercise when you are at your desk is what we call the YWTL exercises. It's kind of like doing the YMCA. Um, but what you want to do is start with your arms up like this. This is the Y. But now you're not just going to hold your arms up in the air. What you're going to do once they're up here is you're going to take your shoulder blades and you're going to squeeze them together like you're crushing a can right between those shoulder blades. So we're going to start here at Y. And then W comes down to this position. And we're going to squeeze, 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 squeeze. T is here, and we're going to squeeze, and then L comes down at your sides, and we're going to squeeze there, and if you come back down after that, you'll feel that your whole posture has changed. Your shoulders are back, you get a little bit of a stretch through the chest, and things are nice and tightened up between those shoulder blades. So um, those are my very favorite. If you just did that every 30 minutes, it would reset your posture, it would get some good movement um, going through those joints, and get counteract some of that negative messaging going to the brain. Now, it's important too when we're talking about that negative messaging and why movement is important. Well, when we create movement in the body and we give movements to the joints, it stimulates these particular fibers in your spinal cord um, called proprioceptors. And when proprioceptors are stimulated, it sends surges of positive messaging up to the brain, which ultimately then lowers your stress response. So every time we're getting up, moving the body, giving it some stimulation, it's actually lowering our overall stress response. Now, I'd love to tell you that just doing some stretches throughout the day is going to be sufficient to reduce, um, to reduce physical stress in your body and that that's going to be great for reducing your overall stress response. But the bottom line is that we need to incorporate active movement into our lives as well. And I mean exercise. Um, when we exercise, we get surges of positive messaging sent to the brain um, and it helps make us feel more relaxed and happy after the fact. And we simply just have to counteract the fact that we spend way too much sedentary um, in relation to what our bodies were really designed to do. Now, several people will say to me, I don't have, I, you know, gym members are, gym memberships are expensive. I don't have time. I don't want to join. I don't like group classes. Well, these are all valid arguments, but the bottom line is you can get really, really great workouts in at home with very little space, little to no equipment, and very little time. And the way that you do this is to um, use body weight exercises. Now, if you go online and you type in body weight exercises, you will get pages of pages um, of suggestions. And some examples would be things like sit-ups, squats, um, lunges, push-ups, um, all of these use your own body weight as resistance. And the great thing about body weight exercises is that they're almost all modifiable as well. So for example, if you can't do a push up on your toes, you can drop to your knees. If that's still too challenging, you can get up and do it on a tabletop. And if that's still challenging yet, you can get up against a wall and do them that way. If we're looking at something like a squat, if you can't come into a full squat, but you can go to 45 degrees, that works. If you can't do that, but you can simply sit on a chair and come up to a standing position from a chair, that works as well. So they require no equipment and they're all highly modifiable. 
then all you need to do is figure out how to structure it. When I travel, I work out every day and I this is how I work out on vacation. And I do one of two things typically. Um, the first is that I like to do a Tabata structure and some of you may have done a Tabata class at your gym. Um, but the great thing is you can actually download free Tabata timers on your phone and they will tell you when to start and when to stop and will guide you through the whole thing. But what Tabata means is simply 20 seconds of an exercise with a 10 second break for four minutes. So as an example, if I was picking squats, my Tabata timer would say go, I'd do squats for 20 seconds, it would tell me to stop, I'd get a 10 second rest, and I would do this for four minutes. If you pick four or five of these different exercises and do a Tabata for each, I promise you will feel very well worked out and will likely be sore the next day. Tabata is supposed to be one of the most uh, metabolically efficient ways to exercise and requires very little space and uh, no equipment. The other thing that you can do is just set up little rounds for yourself. So um, set a timer, say you wanna do 15 minutes. You pick three or four exercises. So let's say I pick squats, sit-ups, and push-ups, and I'm gonna do 10 of each of those exercises. And I'm just gonna cycle through that circuit until my timer's up and keep track of how many times I can get through. If you start to be consistent with this exercise um, and you do that same workout again in a month, you'll be shocked at how much stamina you've built, how much strength you've built, and how much more you can do later than you start with. Um, so there are really, e really easy ways to structure um, workouts at home. And also, fortunately, we live in the day and age of YouTube, which means that if you go on YouTube and you type at home body weight exercises, you will get link after link of um, ways to connect and do things at home. So simply trying to incorporate you know 12 to 20 minutes of physical activity every day will really really impact your overall um, overall health it will do reduce your stress and will help counteract the fact that we're sedentary way more than we should be um, while we're talking about movement it's actually a perfect time for me to explain um, how what I do as a chiropractor helps your stress response as well um, when we do a chiropractic adjustment, we're really looking to restore good motion and function into um, the joints of your body that are directly associated with your spinal cord. And when we can get these joints moving properly again, it reduces the overall um, interference and irritation on the nervous system. And when we get a reduction in these two things, um, it lowers the stress response. Also, when we give an adjustment, it's going to send some of those positive messages um, up to the brain because we've stimulated those fibers in the cord as well, and that's going to help reduce your overall stress response as well. Plus, if you're somebody who is in pain, if you recall back to the beginning of this lecture, your body's already communicating to you that it needs help and that um, it can no longer adapt on its own. So we're going to try to help you um, eliminate some of these symptoms that you're experiencing. So if you've taken the time to watch this whole um, video and you're somebody that's either A, doing pretty well, but you really want to optimize your performance and know how you can really be functioning at your very best, or B, you're a person who's really struggling and has a lot of those symptoms going on in their body and you're just kind of tired of it and want some help, I would invite you to come have um, a consult and exam with me. Uh, for anyone who's watching this, we do invite you to come to the clinic and have a full consult and exam with me, including any x-rays we would deem necessary, and we do that all as a courtesy. So if you um, simply visit Thrive Cairo MN, um, our website, you can gather all of our contact information there. And if you just mentioned that you um, followed my lecture uh, virtually, then we would be happy to honor that complimentary consult and exam for you. So um, I hope that you guys have all been able to take, you know, at least a couple of things away from this that can change your overall health trajectory. And I just hope that you are all well. Thanks so much.